So imagine with me for a few minutes. The year is 586 BC, and you are a middle class ed educated Israelite. Maybe a government scribe, maybe an artisan, but the unthinkable has happened. Jerusalem, your home, has been destroyed, burned to the ground after a long siege by the Babylonians. And you have been force marched all the way to Babylon, two months of walking up north into modern day Syria, and then down the long path of the Euphrates River into modern day Iraq. After all that, you reach the huge, elaborate, intimidating Ishtar Gate of Babylon, the blue gate seemingly designed to show you how much stronger Babylon is than your little hometown. Then you are put to work, conscripted to use your skills for the Babylonian Empire. You always wanted to use your education and your artistry to do creative, beautiful things for your people and your God. But here we are, life is not as you planned. Ever since you arrived in Babylon, you've been hearing the story of Marduk, the Babylonian god. After all, Marduk seems to have won. The people who worship Marduk utterly destroyed the people who worship Yahweh, which must mean Marduk is stronger and better and more real. And so you keep hearing this story of Marduk. That out of the chaos and infighting of many gods, the young upstart god Marduk fought and killed and emerged as the strongest. And from the carcass of the goddess he defeated, Marduk created the world. And then he created humans as slaves of the gods to do their grunt work so that the gods might rest. Day in and day out, you think about this story as you transcribe the text for the Babylonian Empire, just working for the man. You've become a cog in a machine you never wanted to live in, and it's hard not to wonder if this story they're telling is true. But once a week, early in the morning, before you have to report to work, you gather with the Sabbath community, the exiled people, the people who worship Yahweh, and you gather to tell a different story. The story of a God who created the world from nothing and then looked on that creation and said, oh, how exceedingly good. We have done good work. Now, with the whole creation, let's rest and enjoy it. What a different story that is than the story of Marduk that's breathing down your neck. The Marduk story says you belong to a weak and inferior people. The Sabbath story says you are very good. The Marduk story says you're only good enough to keep around if you produce enough to show your worth by your work. The Sabbath story claims that you have a value beyond what you produce. So you cling to the Sabbath story and the Sabbath community and you keep telling the story. And during this time in Babylon, this story, Genesis 1, comes into its written form. Now, I asked you to imagine yourself in 586 BC, but I could go back and make the same point, even if I changed a few details. I could change Marduk to Pharaoh, Babylon to Egypt, and talk about how Pharaoh only cared about the bottom line of making bricks for the empire, the Sabbath story tells you that God cares for you beyond the bricks you make. Cares enough to invite you out of that captivity and into rest. Or I could change Babylon to Rome in the time of Jesus. Our gospel story tells how Jesus spoke to those who were burdened with the unending slog to make ends meet in the Roman Empire that piled on the taxes and in a religious institution that had become complicit with the empire laying more rules and taxes on the people. But Jesus beckons disciples to follow him into a rhythm of life that will lighten the load and allow for their souls to rest. 
I could even change the details and change Babylon to Washington, D.C., the seat of power in today's world. Washington also tells the story of work and efficiency and power, production. Washington measures our worth by what we do and how much influence we have. And there's a story deep in the American tradition that says we need to work, work, work. We need to work ourselves out of poverty. We need to work our country into a better place. We need to work so that we may have meaning. And even those of us who see flaws in that story have parts of it deep inside us. All of this is why we need the story of Sabbath. Probably, though, when I say the word Sabbath, many of you don't think of beauty and delight and rest from oppression. Possibly you think of an antiquated biblical commandment. You think of blue laws of states where you can't buy alcohol on Sundays or the movie theaters were closed in your childhood. You think of starched clothes and Sunday best and a dictum to keep the Sabbath day holy, which translated more like don't have any fun on Sunday. Or possibly, you think rest sounds nice, but you think of an impractical, out-of-touch idea about the world. It sounds nice to rest once a week, but when you have a job, children, volunteer commitments, colleges to get into, career advancement to consider, houses and yards to maintain, you simply can't afford a whole day of rest. You'll catch a breath when you get a chance, which sometimes just means the next time you get sick and are forced to rest. So given all the ways that we think about Sabbath, let's not start with commands and rules and practicalities. Let's start with the story. To start with the Sabbath story is to remember that when God created the world, God looked at everything God had made and said, wow, this is very good. Full stop. We were very good to God before any work had been done, simply because we exist. We are very good to God before we get up in the morning and fuel up with coffee and do all the things. To start with the Sabbath story is also to remember that Jesus said to all who would be his disciples, stop with the heavy burdens and the running around and meeting the demands of this empire. The way of life that I am calling you to has a rhythm, a lightness, a joy. The way of life that I am calling you to will give you rest for your souls. And to start with a Sabbath story is also to explore your own story and mine. What is your rhythm? When do you work? How do you rest? What feels like work? And what feels more like like a chance to rest? Is your rhythm life-giving or oppressive? What's your story? Some of us work extra long hours at our paying job and struggle to keep up with external demands for billable hours or documentation or internal demands to be the best we can be for our country or our client or our patient. Some of us pride ourselves on having a good balance of job and family or life outside of our job, but the truth is that whether we're at work or at home, we're still running around with a constant to-do list in our heads. Or some of us are full-time parents or full-time volunteers, and even though we don't have a boss telling us what to do, we're still always wondering how we can fit enough hours in the day. And then some of us have flexible schedules, and we don't feel we deserve a day of rest every week, because on the six weekdays, we sure haven't accomplished as much as we should have. And some of us are students, constantly told that our grades and our activities and our papers and our resumes need to measure up so that we can make it to college or grad school or the next job. If we're honest, most of us believe some version of the story of Marduk. We act as though we were put on this earth by a God who only cares about the grunt work we can accomplish to let God get a break. We act like we are cogs in a machine and we just have to keep running without stopping to think and to be. It can seem impossible or legalistic or prudish to stop. 
And here's my own confession. I don't exactly know how to stop working, whether at home or at church or anywhere else in the community. And sometimes it's because staying in motion helps me feeling in control. And sometimes it's because I don't believe that the world can keep going without me. Sometimes it's because I'm somewhere deep down worried that if I don't keep doing everything, I won't have measured up to being a follower of Christ. Sometimes it's because I just read the newspaper, and how in the world could I take a break when there are sick children in cages funded by my tax dollars, and South Sudan is on the brink of famine, and I'm already not doing enough, and how can I prioritize my own spiritual health or self-care above the lives of others? But this is broken thinking. This is arrogance. The world, in fact, can keep spinning when I take a break. And God did not create me just to do the grunt work of the world. God absolutely did create me to be a part of healing and wholeness in the world, but that can't be accomplished through the same work, work, work mentality that drives the systems of power. Staying up later won't end hunger. Perhaps God cares more about who we are becoming than how much we can accomplish in a week. Perhaps God knows better than we that a healthy rhythm of work and rest is what equips us for the creative thinking and living we need to be real agents of change in the world. So there's an old legend, a kind of Christian version of the tortoise and the hare, about a pioneer wagon train on the way from St. Louis to Oregon. Good Christians that they were, the group stopped to rest every Sunday. But winter was coming and some were anxious about arriving on time. So they suggested that the group travel all seven days a week. The caravan could not agree, so they split up. Half continued the rhythm of travel for six days and rest for one, and the other half traveled all seven days of the week. Guess which one arrived first? (laughs) The one that kept the Sabbath, of course. The breaks energized them for the journey. And even though this little tale seems to fit perfectly into a defense of Sabbath, and even though there's a logic to it, I actually despise this story. Because it implies that the Sabbath exists in order to make us more productive. But the point of rest is to equip us to enter the race yet again. And that's not the Sabbath story. So I think if I were rewriting this legend, I'd tell it more like this. Half of the caravan began to travel every day of the week, and they made it to Oregon in exactly 63 days and gave themselves a gold star. But the other half arrived just two days later, overflowing with joyful stories. They shared about the mountains they'd seen, and how in their worship they'd written a new song about it. They told about the time they had been paused along a stream when a migrant family wandered up and begged for food and they had enough to share. They explained that in their time of prayer together one Sunday, they felt a pull to set up a hospital once they reached Oregon, a place of healing for anyone who was sick or injured. In other words, Sabbath had slowed them down a little bit, but not enough to cause a problem. And meanwhile, it had opened up a generative and creative space for them to encounter God and find joy and grow deeper in their community in service to the world. So would you be willing to explore what Sabbath like that might look like in our lives today? It doesn't have to be legalistic. It doesn't have to be Sunday, Saturday, or any 24-hour period exactly where you just stop every kind of work might not start with saying a bunch of saying no to a bunch of things but rather with a question of what we want to say yes to one writer on sabbath shares her fond memories of childhood sundays a day set apart for special activities like pancakes instead of the usual weekday oatmeal hikes in the woods to see the fall colors inviting friends over for hot dogs cooked by the fireplace, a simple meal that allowed them to invite others and felt like a treat. Opening a time of intentional rest each week can create life-giving spaces. 
When I was a college student, caught in the thick of stress about studies and papers and everything else, a wise mentor suggested to me that I try observing the Sabbath just for Lent. I still remember the second week of Lent that year, when I spent much of Saturday evening to finish my homework so that I could fully rest on Sunday. And I found myself thinking, this is really dumb. I could have been spending this time with my friends. Instead, I stayed up late just to stick to a rule. But my tune changed, because late that Sunday afternoon, my roommate got a call from her mom, and her cousin had died suddenly in a car accident. She was beside herself. She couldn't concentrate on studying. She didn't want to be alone. And thanks be to God, I had the time and space just to be with her that evening. Since that day, I've had my ups and downs with Sabbath keeping, but I've never stopped believing that God invites us into a rhythm of rest and work for a reason. It is a gift to us to remember that work doesn't define us, and it's a gift to the world because it creates space and availability for our presence and relationships and love. May God open our eyes and hearts to this gift as we continue to explore it in the weeks ahead. Amen.